Okay. Okay. So I will start from Okay, I am Faisal Kayu and my way of uh, presenting this topic would be slightly non-conventional. So I will start from uh, the general properties of the material. We are generally familiar with the mechanical properties of metals and their stress and strain behavior. And then we also know very generally about the brittle and ductile materials and we know how ductile materials deform more and absorb more energy during deformation. And this uh, energy absorption criteria of materials is very necessary for a lot of uh, processes. Um, we want materials to undergo large deformations and have high stress handling capacity which is needed for manufacturing of uh, components and then later in their uh, service life or we call it life after failure as well. So for example when a car crashes we want it to absorb a lot of energy uh, during deformation so less energy reaches the driver and more energy absorb, absorb the car, so we save lives rather than saving systems or structures. So this is basically the, um, this uh, property is important and we want to uh, make that property, we want to improve that property of a material or specifically control it for our requirements. Um, what so what happens is that these properties and attributes are generally controlled by the microstructures of the material. So if we look at this car, this is a very huge component scale. But if we look at the material under the microscope, we look a picture, we will look at a picture something like this. And this is the microstructure of the material where the crystal structure, the uh, the bigger scale of the atoms where they come together and they are um, responsible for the properties which we have for our materials now. And just remember that when we want to improve our materials, basically this is the microstructure which we are improving and throughout my presentation, this is the scale which I will be talking about. So when you will look at these um, square uh, pictures and I will always talk about the properties and the materials, just remember that we are talking about this scale and not the component scale. So these are two different things. So yeah, the picture which I showed you is a light microscope picture of a trip steel um, zirconia composite. So we have a metal matrix um, with uh, steel and then we have zirconia particles embedded in it. Here you can clearly see it in bright and dark fringes. And these materials were invented recently at um, um, Institute of uh, Material Science and Materials Engineering at our university and a lot of research has been done on them. So what we see is that during deformation, these materials absorb a large amount of energy. And why is that? Because the matrix undergoes a large deformation and converts from austenite phase into martensite phase. Uh, let's leave the terminologies for later, but what happens is that uh, this um, softer phase is converting into a harder phase, so it absorbs a lot of energy while doing that, and then that harder phase is difficult to deform, so it absorbs further more energy. And then, so, uh, on, the, on the other side, um, the zirconia particles also undergo martensite transformation, so they are strengthening the matrix as well as absorbing energy while deforming. And then at higher strains, what we see is that the interface decohesion between, between the zirconia particles and the matrix starts to occur, and this is the initiation of the damage, so the material properties start to degrade and eventually the material fails. So this is the overall mechanism of how the material is going through different deformation phases. And we want to maximize on that. The, it is complicated, the mechanical behavior of the material is complicated and is dependent on the composition of the composite, um, the grain size and the orientation distribution, the manufacturing technique by which we constructed it how much deformation or with what speed we are deforming the material, the working temperatures, chemistry of the constituents, and so on and so on. And most of these parameters are um, interdependent. So one parameter is affecting the other one um, in response. And the problem is that it is difficult to um, see the interplay or experimentally determine the interplay of all these uh, parameters which are happening at a very small scale with a lot of experimentation. 
Uh, and therefore, we have a general understanding of how the material is behaving, where we do not completely understand the effect of material parameters and their interdependence um, precisely, and therefore we cannot predict how, by changing what, how the material will behave. Now, uh, one efficient and effective way of doing it is by using mathematical modeling. A lot of people have tried to do that. So what they do is they use constitutive models um, uh, which are generally mechanics based or which are uh, temperature or strain rate based and what they do is they try to um, f uh, develop a model, uh, fit a lot of parameters and then show the results which are for example here shown on the screen. The problem with these models, mathematical mod the superficial I would say mathematical models is that Although they capture the material attributes nicely, they, uh, but the problem is that they are always missing the microstructural information. So the input of these models is always certain parameters which we always get from some mechanical or microstructural tests and then we can predict these um, behaviors very nicely. But the problem with these systems is that we need to calibrate them with extensive experiments of certain types and whenever we change our material uh, we change a certain attribute in the material microstructure we again have to come back and uh, calibrate these models so they can um, interpolate and extrapolate the data of our material so they do not work independently but rather are extensively dependent on the experimental data and for a nice model, what we want is basically to have a numerical model which is based on real physical microstructural properties, which is flexible for modeling single or multi-phase materials, which is dependent on the composition of the material, which is dependent on the grain orientation of the material. So all the microstructural attributes and then we also want the model to be flexible so we can extract the global results of deformation and also very local results such as the local strains such as strains around the particles or how they are distributed in the matrix, the stresses, the local orientation change, the twinning transformation, so all the deformation phenomena which are having, uh, which are occurring and eventually the inset of uh, deformation and damage. So how they are happening and uh, uh, what is uh, uh, going on uh, at this scale. Uh, so yeah, so th that's what we would ideally want to have. So my thesis uh, topic um, was to, to develop a microstructurally informed numerical simulation model for predicting the structure property relationship in drip steel matrix and zirconia particle composites. And this is where it comes from. So now by looking at the background, we already have an idea of why microstructurally informed modeling is important because that is where all the properties and attributes of the material are coming from. And this uh, uh, makes our, uh, and playing with that actually results in uh, better properties. Uh, then a lot of work which I did in the beginning of my PhD was selection and calibration of um, an, an appropriate model which we will look forward in the presentation and then I will quickly skim through the execution phase of building up on that idea on constructing simple models and then uh, building up on verified models and then eventually I will reach a point of um, where my dissertation currently is, so reaching the desired solutions of developing structure property relationships. And in the end, I will conclude my presentation with the concluding remarks. So just to quickly go through, Damask is a very uh, flexible crystal plasticity based tool where it is um, con considering it is consistent of certain blocks. So what we do is we can give a custom microstructure model input. So we can use a real microstructure or can virtually construct a microstructure and give it as input in the Damask model, and then we can apply and we can fine tune and um, define all the nitty gritty and details of the mechanical properties of the different phases at every point. And then we can deform the material at uh, our desired deformation speeds or paces or things like this. And then we can solve our problem. 
So the solution basically is written in a, a, a binary spectral out file and then we can post process the results in a global, to see the global response. For example, we are familiar with the stress strain curves by averaging the results for every increment in the load uh, step. Or we can also look at the results at the local scale that how the material is deforming. So this is something which we started off with because it is a very flexible tool and in that time it was still under development. Now most of the blocks are built and developed and so on. So we are moving forward with it quite well. When I start with the initial example, so if we take, um, uh, I will show here a very general example of what we started off with. So this is a microstructure of a multi-phase steel material. And we are taking a very small area out of it. So the window shows that this is what we took from here. And then by using uh, image processing techniques uh, and um, using Python, we transformed this pixel by pixel into a digital file. And then we assign these two um, phases, different attributes and properties. And then we load this in the tensile direction and we see uh, stress and strain results. So this is basically the very basic example of um, how the model is actually working by looking at a simple example. Now when we see here, we are only taking very isotropic metrics here and very isotropic particles here and this is precisely the problem which we want to mitigate. So to build up on this um, problem, what I started doing was that um, using uh, actual microstructures of the materials which we see under the light microscope. And again, we are taking this window out of it and then um, uh, cropping it to this size and then post-processing it in a way to convert it, it uh, pixel by pixel into a certain um, uh, phase map and then by virtually adding up a, a, a virtually adding up a matrix with different polycrystalline grains here to construct virtual RVEs which mimic the actual behavior of the material during deformation. And then when we apply load um, uh, and, uh, on, on this we see the local stress and strain distributions and, um, and so on. Uh, the problem with this model is that it is um, it has a very um, non-realistic, I would say, um, metrics phase because it is virtually constructed, uh, but the results were quite promising. So we want to add up on using real microstructures and then looking at the behaviors more um, in detail. So courtesy, thanks to uh, Robert Leonard at Institute of uh, Materials uh, Engineering, he gave me this very nice phase map of a material at a very close uh, position, where we see that th uh, this is an austenite matrix, which I was specifically dealing with in my problem. And then we have other phases like martensite and ferrite. Uh, uh, f uh, filling uh, filling up and then he ran some um, in situ uh, tensile tests in 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 his work on this kind of microstructure um, with a grain uh, uh, which is along 001 plane and then I used his data to run my simulations using um, calibrated models um, which I did in my work uh, as well and then we see the local comparison of uh, results from numerical simulation and local comparison of results from uh, experimentation. So here I'm only comparing uh, the strain distributions and we see from all these points, for example, where, this, where seven is mentioned, where eight is mentioned, where five is mentioned, that the results are qualitatively comparable. Of course, we can get much more information from um, simulations than just local strain maps. Uh, but we see that the qualitatively they are accurate, but quantitatively uh, not not so great. So uh, the, the the numerical simulation predicts strains slightly higher than what we what we are actually observing in experiments, and that is because of several assumptions and um, several phenomena which are still missing. For example, grain boundary motion and the third dimension of the uh, representative volume element which is present here. So after covering all the bases and everything, what we did was we then added up on the, we incorporated damage criteria. So at higher strains, we are still able to predict the material properties 
uh, quite accurately. And then here you see a virtually constructed IPF map of, um, as a, um, of a phase map which was smartly designed so we have um, a well resolved and also not so large RVE so we can reduce the computation times and yeah we ran the simulations by using calibrated data uh, which was already published throughout the work and then we applied tensile load on it to deform the RVE. Um, looking at the global results it is quite an overwhelming and complicated graph but we see that the stress strain behavior is increasing and then the damage starts to occur in the zirconia particles and eventually the stiffness degrades um, uh, then we see that the damage initiates at this point and then eventually um, the material stiffness drops we also see the phenomena other phenomena like uh, dislocation density increasing and uh, transformation of austenite phase into martensite phase um, happening throughout the um, uh, imp uh, applied strain field and then this slide is um, quite interesting to watch as we see that uh, the RVE which we applied load on when it starts to deform we can see the evolution of results at the very local scale happening so we see uh, the damage initiation between the zirconia particles here and uh, so it is a brittle damage and then the ductile damage happening on the interface of uh, austenite and zirconia particles and then slowly uh, the the voids start to occur and coalesce and the damage initiates and propagates further and further and we also see the dislocation density increasing with that and when I see the effect of uh, damage initiation and propagation on the local uh, stress and phase transformation regimes, we see that initially the stress is quite high in the zirconia particles and eventually as soon as the damage occurs, uh, the stresses start to relax. And um, yeah, the eventually the, the stresses shift from the places of high stress regime where they relax to places where there is relatively lower stress. And yeah, we see a lot of stress relaxation in the area where there is a lot of damage. So from these simulations, what um, what we have we have reached a point where we are able to get quite accurate. Um, uh, global results and as well as local results. So if I capture this phenomenon nicely, frame by frame, we see that damage initiates, uh, dam brittle damage initiates between the zirconia particles where the stress reached the maximum point and also on the um, uh, austenite and uh, zirconia interface. And then it starts to propagate and then coalesce together to form a relatively uh, small cracks in the material and eventually these are responsible for material damage and then eventually more damage is occurring in the rest of the material. And if I plot these uh, uh, damage occurring planes uh, uh, as per my load and compare them with experimental observations, we see a nice correlation with something which has already been reported in the literature before. So. Uh, until now, we have established a very interesting model which can predict the material behavior according to the microstructural changes in the microstructural attributes and is uh, capable enough of predicting the properties on the global scale and on the local scale. But I want to come to this picture back again to show that all these phenomena are not independently working, so they are all in, uh, interdependent. So the position of the particles, the, uh, the orientation of the grains is largely affecting the local stress and strain distribution, which is responsible for the stress triaxiality and the initiation of the damages. And then that in response is uh, responsible for stress relaxation and so on and so on. So it is a very complicated phenomena and it is even difficult to understand it in 3D, but the numerical simulation model accurately captures it. So um, we can use this model for uh, microstructure property uh, modeling which is something which I'm working currently on. So kind of at the last phase of my PhD where I have to um, develop these kind of microstructures by changing the different uh, parameters in the microstructure, run full phase simulations like I showed you before, uh, a lot of simulations collecting global and local results and see how this changing attributes are affecting these local results uh, by using some statistical methods 
and then eventually construct structure property maps. So we understand that if we want to achieve this kind of property in a material, we need to have this kind of microstructure or possibly in the future in reverse. So this is the property which we want to have in a material for a certain application and what should a microstructure look like. So we theoretically should be able to um, uh, do that by using the, these kind of detailed models and machine learning in the future. So when I look at my um, PhD timeline, it, 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 I have shown it with a flat line here to just capture what I showed you previously. So the idea of the PhD was um, to uh, have a model, a detailed model like this, and then with a lot of literature review, with playing with different software, data structures, uh, tuning and validation of the material models, and then using those models and building up on the limitations on, the, on those models. And eventually, I stand here where I'm working on understanding the structure property relationships. And, me, and while doing this, everything, um, we were able to publish all our work. So, um, and with publications, I sp specifically focused on showing the strengths of what we have achieved, and also in the discussion section, the limitations of what still needs to be done, which I feel is always important. But it is always not very linear. And I made this slide to uh, show the um, actual ongoing interplay of how we think a PhD would go in a flat line. But it actually goes around several ideas in circles and then ideas from ideas which keep on generating. And then somehow when we try to um, see the bigger picture, uh, it transforms into um, publications and then they lead to more ideas and eventually this whole jumbled up thing is something which I call a dissertation. So you, once you are at a certain position only then you know where you have to go forward with. So yeah. Um, and this whole work is basically is not my own thing. I really would like to acknowledge everyone else but first of all i acknowledge my own resilience and persistence because i never thought i possessed it and um, i discovered with time that yeah a man is capable of many things which we do not think we are i would like to thank hec and day day for sponsoring my um, stay here for my phd institute of metal forming for um, receiving me as a phd student and then guiding me through every step all the people here for useful discussions. I would like to specifically thank SFB799, uh, Professor Biermann and his team for always uh, helping me with the data and the knowledge and information which they shared. And I was able to get more insight and details into this work. Uh, Max Planck Institute for Iron Research, uh, team of uh, Professor Franz Roters and uh, Martin Dehill, who helped me with uh, learning the mask, using it, and then adding up on it to uh, see my results. Um, all my colleagues and um, friends and family for useful uh, discussions and support and or to all the peers, um, editors and reviewers who read my work and gave their feedback on. So yeah, that was all about my presentation. Thank you very much and I am now open to the questions. that I see. Hmm? <laughs> uh, yes.
visualize the data. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's complicated. So basically, uh, uh, so so it's complicated. But uh, generally, it is easier to uh, visualize the data and compare with experimental observations in two D. But but actually, the material in um, actual environment is deforming in 3D, but we are only observing it from the surface. So we are only getting 2D results, but actually it is deforming 2D, uh, 3D. But in um, our simulations, we are either running 3D simulations or 2D simulations, and it is always a challenge to compare these data sets. So this is where the limitations of these tools is. And this is a, a part of uh, my work which I am trying to address as well. So for now, what we have done is we are trying to statistically compare the data, but not really pixel by pixel or point by point comparison. So that makes more sense um, in, in, in that way. So one way is to uh, compare 2D data, and then the other possibility is to Can you hear me? No. Thank you.